Zombie movies have held a special place in my heart ever since I was a kid. My Uncle Kevin would watch the Romero films almost daily with his eyes glued to the screen as would be mine over time. All of them are timeless treasures embodying social commentary of the human condition and what we truly are. A lot of which went way over my head as a kid and young adult since I was there just to watch zombies and the carnage that ensued. I know, perfect viewing content for a young wow. When the early 2000s rolled around, Romero returned to the big screens one last time before going direct to video with the budget, crew, and cast to really push his vision. Focusing on the undead, the post-apocalyptic world, the survivors, and to capture elements of every dead film before it with 2005's Land of the Dead. To say I was enthralled with this movie is an understatement. Land of the Dead had cinched the fact that I loved zombies and zombie accessories. It was fun, but also brutal. It was dorky, but also meaningful. It was dark, but also flashy. Land of the Dead is considered to be a real hit or miss film for many diehard fans, usually ranked below its predecessors by critics and review outlets. Does it deserve to be shunned or praised? How does it stand as a continuation of Romero's ideas? How does it stand as its own movie dedicated to the dead, and what do its ideas represent? Today, we are discussing Land of the Dead, a swan song in zombie cinema. Now you may ask why I labeled this video a swan song, considering Land of the Dead is not Romero's final film, nor a final dead film. Rather, it focuses on this being the final installment in Romero's original continuity before Diary and Survival of the Dead basically reset the zombie timeline. Although the zombie timeline was pretty fractured and janky considering this would jump from 1968 to 2005's culture with no really big in-between. Regardless, I would like to argue Land of the Dead was a culmination of everything that led up to that point and was a great way to complete the saga laid out by Romero. Many argue that George's greatest works can be night, dawn, and or day of the dead, all being microcosms within specific spaces, i.e. a farm, a mall, and an underground missile silo that accentuate tongue-in-cheek symbolisms of society and the people within. Night of the Living Dead speaks on the American dream, the paranoia of war, subversion of expectations for heroes, and an unintentional study on racism. Dawn of the Dead represents blind consumerism and how material things will drive us to being the walking dead ourselves. Day of the Dead was on humanity being its own worst enemy and how we can be the real monsters. Is it tongue-in-cheek? Of course, but for its time, pretty progressive, especially stacked up against the generic zombie fad that had swept up popular culture with Return of the Living Dead's brains-obsessed zombies. Land of the Dead expands outwards with its setting. Instead of one specific area that dominates the bulk of the film, we ping-pong between the ravenous outside world, the slums of the outer city, and the rich upper crust of Fiddler's Green, a survivor colony that has been able to stay functioning years into the zombie outbreak thanks to the efforts of scavengers, outlaws, and ruffians braving the zombie-filled world all for the higher class, getting any supplies they can to feed and power an oppressive regime of the rich while those in the slums barely get scraps to survive. The focus of Land of the Dead being one of class struggle in our society and how tilted the scales are, even during the worst times in our history, with those that do all the heavy lifting, all the killing, all the work looking to leave and fend for themselves even if it means going into the harsh elements of the land of the dead while the wealthy sit back and enjoy the spoils and the poor rest more and more in squalor. Land also coincides with another progression of Romero's films, and that is the evolution of the living dead. While Night had the dead as pure ghouls eating flesh, Dawn had shown the dead had retained a modicum of their former selves, even if it were to just mindlessly flock to the mall and remember parts of their past lives, and Day showing Bub being an isolated case that zombies did in fact hold the capacity to learn, to want more than to just eat flesh, and to even empathize and adapt. Land of the Dead goes all out in the exploration of the zombie's evolution, with the titular zombie Big Daddy leading the progression from near mindless undead 
to near critical thinking primitives of the zombie horde. There is so much at play that I feel that this movie was the culmination of everything Romero had worked on and towards, having the largest budget of all of his films by far, even beating out Dawn of the Dead's 1978 budget that would adjust to about $6 million in 2005's day, compared to Land of the Dead's budget of up to $19 million. Romero was allowed to let his screenplays and writings go unrestricted for once, especially considering how Day of the Dead had to be heavily revised into what it was numerous times to fit a diminished budget. Hybridizing elements of every film before it, not only with plot elements, but with the building blocks of his Living Dead saga. All having this real genuine campiness that comes from his own brand of horror. Charlie? Kills. Even. Not. and dialogue zombies man they creep me out becoming a crash course in dark humor frequently throughout the film that fed into people like me's kind of comedy The memorability of characters and even individual zombies having iconic scenes that define the movie, and probably most important to Romero and zombie fans alike, was the unabashed and top-notch gore and practical effects that I wish I could show you, but YouTube is going to censor me. A big part in Romero's legacy is not only his underlying commentary, but just the all-out realistic and stellar carnage and detailed decay of every zombie. He's the godfather of the dead for a reason. The use of practical effects and some CG in the movie really shines, going over the top with gore, body horror, and just plain goofy scenes that toy with the stomach-churning concepts more. Hell, who could forget the pre Priest zombie with his head barely hanging off his neck that just whips it to surprise by the soldier. Classic. Land of the Dead had no shortage in talent either, using its budget to enlist big name actors like John Leguizamo and Dennis Hopper. For me, a Mario Movie 93 rematch between Luigi and Bowser to dial up the scale of the film for a broader audience, but also to keep it grounded and not overly Hollywood by hiring lesser known actors like Simon Baker, striking a healthy balance between his low budget origins to finally having the budget he wanted for his full scale vision, even saying he would use elements that were originally scrapped from Day of the Dead and its limited budget, all creating a world from which a large cast of diverse characters could all exist in both separate and together environments that they eventually clash in, to make it feel like it broke the barriers of a condensed experience that again brings together everything George A. Romero had built upon and worked with for decades. Hell, even Guillermo del Toro stated this, it's a cause of celebration amongst all of us that Michelangelo has started another ceiling. It's really a momentous occasion. So for us to really sink our teeth into this movie, where better to start than the central setting of the film than Fiddler's Green? Bordered on three sides by mighty rivers, Fiddler's Green offers luxury living in the grand old style. Fiddler's Green being the safe haven for the living as they attempt to live lives foreign from the undead outside the city limits. Fashioned together within a well-preserved section of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, one Paul Kaufman would take to seizing it to create a veritable paradise of the wasteland, a shining beacon in the dark parallel to something like New Vegas in Fallout. Fiddler's Green would be a slight homage to Dawn of the Dead's mall-centric consumerism, showing that that way of life was what was apparently to be strived for. Speaking about fine dining at six different restaurants, being able to visit a fully stocked shopping mall, and more, depicting how, even with the world knee-deep in years of zombies, 
zombie shit that people and those with the funds that have it will still flock to places to shop and eat in luxury and pretend like nothing bad is going on. But for the small percentage of people that would enjoy the fat of the picked clean land, the rest would struggle day to day. Most people within the town would fight over scraps that were ejected from the tower in slums and ghettos. As one man puts it, He didn't build that place, he just took it over, kept the best for himself, and left us with a slum to live in. The living conditions being somewhere between the streets of Detroit and Freeside of New Vegas. Fiddler's Green's lower outskirts are a rat hole. Gambling, prostitution, drug deals, the whole nine yards, even with the general public betting on if a healthy person will die by two zombies' hands or not, with most funding going towards entertainment and games from the higher ups. Safety not being of much concern as zombies are chained up for fun, using them for picture opportunities, paintball practice, and even as high-stakes ring matches, with the public not regarding how just one bite or scratch from these ghouls means the end of their own miserable lives. Although this may be in large part a reference to Shaun of the Dead, which released one year before Land of the Dead, since zombies ended up just being used for labor and entertainment purposes by the end of Shaun of the Dead. The movie even guest stars Shaun himself, Simon Pegg, and director Edgar Wright, as the photo booth zombies, with Romero loving Shaun of the Dead so much that he invited these two to be main characters in Land of the Dead. But the two declined the invite and simply said they just wanted to be zombie cameos in the film. So canonically, Shaun went to the United States and turned in this timeline. Tangent aside though, people staying close to barrels of fire and bundling up in the cold with zombies pretty close to where they are, living in harsh conditions as money and food are scarce. If you want a real indicator of how bad things are, spam meat is being served in mass as a solitary dish. Yep. With how bad it was, a majority of the people were okay with the way things were simply because they were told they were safe from the world at large. The township was validated in its drastic disparity of class by the justification of its safety and protection, protected not only by natural barriers of rivers being on three sides of this peninsula, with the only accessible land portions being barricaded by high power electrical fences. All deterrence to the undead, enforced by trained armed personnel, or so it would appear to the general public. What was not known is the fact that these trained individuals were just haphazardly found paid off and given guns to give the illusion of high security defenses. For you see, the wealthy of Fiddler's Green took no initiative in their funding, no initiative in seeing actual productivity in ensuring their militia was properly given combat training on how to handle a firearm, to effectively conserve ammo, how to properly aim, and how to combat the dead when all else fails. They would waste ammunition, were clueless in close quarters combat, and were just unfit to serve in a security environment. The contrast shown when Riley, later on in the movie, had to teach a guard how to dispatch zombies without wasting all his ammo. These militia were merely just enforcers that made the public think they were safe, and were more so just bodyguards for the rich that made everyone else feel locked in. You're worried about being locked out, and I see that. I can't help but think we're all locked in. Fiddler's leader Kaufman never cared for the town's well-being, not until the aptly named Cholo, or as I'll call him Choloigi, ran off with Dead Reckoning, a massive, impenetrable vehicle with countless firearms and explosives threatening to raid and destroy the central tower of Fiddler's Green, all because Kaufman had screwed him over, only then causing him any concern, preparing to evacuate himself and his board of directors once shit was hitting the fan choosing to leave everyone in town in the dark, and even planning to kill the main cast of survivors as soon as they return with Dead Reckoning, proclaiming he is justified in his actions and deserves to live and leave because... It was my ingenuity that took an old world and made it into something new. 
I put up the fences to make it safe. I hired the soldiers and paid for their training. I kept the people off the streets by giving them games and vices, which cost me money. But I spent it because the responsibility is mine. Now, do you understand the meaning of the word responsibility? Saying the poor and downtrodden are being given entertainment to make up for their poor living conditions, that he spent his own money for them, this is another on-the-nose depiction of our world situation, but not far off. Knowing the threat of both his disgruntled workers and the undead looming on the city, Kaufman would be the only person besides his faithful butler and his bags of money to escape escape from the city. Watch out, get out, quick! As shit was hitting the fan, the public would be unprepared and unaware, not knowing that this bubble, driven by Class Divide, would soon burst, with the zombies they had known for years being more than they ever bargained for, no longer games or lesser beings. While everyone lived in their microcosm of life in Fiddler's Green, the zombies out in the world were learning, adapting, and evolving. The zombies themselves have a decent chunk of time dedicated solely to them throughout the movie, really accentuating how this world is also theirs and not just something to be seen through the survivor's eyes only. This really being the first and only movie where more than one to two zombies get any real spotlight. It was absolutely necessary for them to all be given the utmost detail and makeup to make them all memorable. It almost felt necessary to have a movie from the perspective of the zombies without it being too hammy. These zombies, having absolutely no prior history to their characters being zombified, personifying an undead body does require subtle bloody details wrapped in not so subtle attire. So the makeup, the costume department, and just the visualization of these zombies was critical and was knocked out of the park. On that note, the softball girl's torn cheek exposing her mouth cavity to be seen as a zombie, but also having pronounced eyes due to her decay to accentuate her heightened and awakening emotions. The butcher, in his less gory but decayed appearance, donning his meat apron and cleaver while having eyes that barely express anything until he begins to attack and don a hellish look. Big Daddy, the leader of the zombies, having sunken in eyes and tightened skin with animalistic teeth, almost like he is a ravenous creature, but more so one that is tired constantly, looking less like a zombie and more like a living person, legitimizing his role as the leader of the newly evolving zombie herd. They all start off their stories in the film meandering about aimlessly in a small abandoned town trying to imitate what they did in their previous lives, trying to play instruments, picking up tools like cleavers and baseball bats and dragging them around, mechanics coming to the sound of the garage bell going off, and then attempting to pump gas for a car that's not even there. They are mimicking the autopilot portions of their previous lives. Without the living to spark their cravings for flesh, they are simply trying to live lives they once had. With sparks flickering in the sky suddenly, as fireworks do every single one of these zombies stop what they're doing and let their entire focus be consumed in witnessing what was once a celebratory event in their lives. All except for Big Daddy, who had shaken off this distraction to notice how easily he and others were being tricked for so long, only for them to be slaughtered by the living as the living laughed, killing the dead for sport and pleasure, using them as target practice. Big Daddy attempts to save other zombies from being killed, only for them to be beheaded and slaughtered, even leaving Big Daddy to mercy kill one of them that was beheaded, showing his empathy that had spurred for his zombie brothers and sisters. It's from one zombie's ideas that we see the gradual progression and the alleviation of the zombie horde, and that was all done by a man, a zombie named Big Daddy. 
While the living bickered over control, resources, and the rights of one another while feeling safe and secure in their secluded compound, the dead slowly but surely sauntered towards the beacon of life that was Fiddler's Green in the endless darkness of the deadened night. The mission never being truly clear, whether it being the zombie hordes draw towards the only sign of life in the wastes so that they can eat, or it being Big Daddy's newfound need for revenge. Regardless, this journey and each step made was one that progressively taught them to overcome their own mental shortcomings and faculties. Big Daddy instructed them how to use the very tools their cold, dead hands had been clinging to for years, using cleavers to break down plywood walls, amassing their numbers to dare down fences in unison, firing weapons with the pull of a trigger, Big Daddy grunting loudly to instruct the horde that they cannot sit and just eat, telling them to keep moving as they had the grander goal of breaching the city for retribution and a larger bounty of flesh, stopping the use of baseball bats to instead brandish assault weapons to more easily kill their foes, they had learned how to use melee weapons and, in a flash, learned how to literally jump the gun and go from caveman to modern man and gun the living down. They also would cut soldiers' arms off as they pulled the pins from grenades so that they kamikaze themselves in half. Romero was peak with this shit, I swear, no cap. They learned how- oh god, that was cringe. That's how good this shit was, it made me say some cringe shit. They learned how to use weapons, work as a unit instead of a massive horde acting independently of one another, and held a sense of self-preservation and rebellion. They had to learn how things work. Big Daddy got a jackhammer and learned that it does not work without a direct source of power. And when other zombies were on fire or in pain, Big Daddy would mercy kill them, showing empathy towards one another, but also learning what needed to be done. All of them eventually dropping the items they related with in the past, like the tambourine zombie leaving behind his instrument to pick up a weapon, so that all of these zombies zombies can lay down their past lives to don weapons of war. Most importantly, the undead have to overcome their natural fear of water. The one barrier, the river, has been a major barrier to hold back the dead for years, with every corpse coming to a full stop at the sight of this body of water, only for Big Daddy to make the plunge into the depths to show the others that their innate fear of drowning holds no bearing on them since they do not require oxygen to live, resulting in the iconic scene of the zombie group all slowly but surely emerging from the murky depths through vacant but determined eyes. I stated this in my iconic scenes in zombie history video, but it really needs to be reiterated. The main barricade of keeping the dead away is ineffective as they surface. The barrier that kept them from progressing not only physically, but mentally, was destroyed, as if rising from their graves a second time, only now as smarter and more versatile undead as a much larger threat to us. The whole film is about their evolution as primitive people, and this scene alone greatly summarizes them becoming a new form of life, looking to overthrow the people that callously killed their own who had lived so lavishly and unaware of the world. These were more than zombies that we had known. They were lesser people who gained a modicum of critical thinking, and they had much to prove as they were reborn in the still waters of the river that once served as a way of restricting their progress. It's with this barricade and the physical land barricades broken that finally the three worlds collide. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The poor, the rich, and the dead. 
blurring the lines on who the true evil entities are in the world once this war begins. The class issues that have been festering within Fiddler's Green for years have largely affected the ultimate fate of what should have been one of the best safe havens humanity could ask for. Sadly, with the culminating disaster that was the undead uprising and the ignorance displayed by those in power, the poor folks at ground level would be the first to be attacked by the undead, slaughtering any and everyone within the city's boundaries, killing the workers as they built up buildings and defenses, wiping out the lower class before the upper class feared any destruction. Those that would defend them would be powerless as they were completely inept at fighting back. The armed security would only shoot carelessly into crowds, missing the critically obvious vital points of the zombies' heads, something they should know at this point, and instead shooting stuff like cars, causing them to explode, and causing fire to break out, making the zombie invasion wholly worse for every single entity involved. Eventually, knocking at the upper class's front door, do we see them at their pinnacle state. Hardened glass being all that separates them from the mall of the luxurious, being systematically chipped away by the very tools of labor and war that built up this establishment. Hammers, knives, guns. Big Daddy delivers the final decisive blow to destroy the glass wall with the jackhammer that had lost power. The zombies may have killed and devoured some of the lower class, but in turn, they have, in a very dark sense of imagination, have melded themselves with the lower class to band together to destroy the higher ups. The rarely seen mall of Fiddler's Green, a slight homage to Dawn of the Dead, comparative to both the screen time of this film and to that of the wide majority of the populace within Fiddler's Green, we barely see any of them all, just like the poor do, is sterile and clean compared to the nasty and cluttered streets of the outside. Now, having its pure floors, now bathed in the higher class's blood. All of this displaying the zombies' carnage of both their undead side and their new tool-using personas, showcasing what Romero knows best, zombie brutality in creative ways. Starting from the poor side going to the rich side, ripping people open to show the creamy center, zombies spitting out belly button piercings in a comical way, silhouettes of hands being split in two in a very messed up demeanor, having the kid on the skateboard eaten alive to have his skateboard fall into the river, the grenade exploding and splitting the guy in two, even having zombie makeup legend Tom Savini guest appear as the biker zombie. A biker from Dawn of the Dead that shows up once the mall has been invaded that turned ages ago within the 1978 film to return in Fiddler's Green to cut down civilians with a machete and a tough guy demeanor. You can tell the effects and makeup department had the time of their lives making these gruesome depictions of the zombies and what they are doing come to life. The brutality accentuating what had been permeating for so long in the all-out war it birthed within Fiddler's Green. While the city began to burn and the streets ran with its people's blood, Cho-Luigi had been thrust out of the dead reckoning to walk to his own fate, battered, shot, and bruised, only to be bitten after getting careless when it comes to just a few zombies. After this, his new goal of starting a new life elsewhere was now gone and detracted. His longtime friend readies to kill him with a shotgun before Cho-Luigi stops him and decides he would rather turn. Nah, nah, you know, you know, I always wanted to see how the other half lives. Choosing to become a zombie, to become undead, to walk the earth as the new species, to see things from the other side. Cho Luigi had always looked down on the zombies, but now was becoming one of them, but also to inadvertently join the undead in the rebellion they were waging against man and the man. Cho Luigi doing so of his own regard to get back at Kaufman by heading back to Fiddler's Green as the infection ravaged his body. The main cast looking to leave Fiddler's Green behind them to be subjugated to their own fate, driving Dead Reckoning, had been alerted to the 
disaster of the zombie attack going on within city limits. Attempting to go back and pick up any survivors they could, they would use the sky flowers and fireworks from before, a distraction that would hopefully leave the dead dumbfounded long enough in an effort to rescue refugees coming out of the city. For a brief moment, this would work. The zombies would be dumbfound, and the survivors that see them coming hopeful, only for every single zombie to look down from the sky to the reality of the world and shake off the light show to understand they were all being duped. No longer would idle distractions lead to their own slaughter, nor would they allow themselves to be deterred from the bigger picture and their ultimate goal of consumption and spread. The residents of the Dead Reckoning would find a horrendous sight. The overprivileged that had scantily set foot out into this world were now facing the harsh realities of it. Thrusted out from their ivory tower, do they find themselves backed against an electrified chain link wall, all together as huddled masses, forced into a corner they themselves created by underfunding their own defenses and grasping the few possessions they could grab, knowing they had nowhere else to go, living a life of luxury where they too woefully unprepared as they watched helplessly as a horde of zombies slowly came towards them, either dying via electrocution or being devoured alive. The undead, with the poor in their stomachs and anger still within their leader's dead heart, attack the entirety of the wealthy populace in one swoop, embodying the timeless old saying of, eat the rich. In the end, nearly all of those within Fiddler's Green are reduced to nothing but victims, food, or newly created zombies. And the survivors of the Dead Reckoning can only watch as they see the last of the population utterly slaughtered. Below the tower does Kaufman prepare his limousine to get away, only for his butler to run away in fear at the sight of Big Daddy. Big Daddy had gone off on his own. He was alone, driven for some reason to confront the cause of his and every person's strife for so long. In the underbelly of this ivory tower does this simple turned mechanic attempt to get to Kaufman and find his own limousine to be a safe place for him. Big Daddy finds a fuel pump nearby. Akinning back to his former life as a working man, as a mechanic, he uses the pump to penetrate the vehicle's glass and starts pumping flammable fuel into the car. Big Daddy fulfills his purpose. He doesn't wish to kill or consume, not quite yet, but a part of his mind, the job that he once enjoyed, knew this gas would lead to the man's downfall. Big Daddy, once the gas starts filling the car, simply walks away, fulfilling the goal he did at the beginning of the movie when we first meet him. When the bell chimes, he goes out to not have purpose. He had no purpose without a car to fuel. With the gas finally filling a car, he finds the purpose that he was looking for for so long. Powerless to stop him, Kaufman only watches as Big Daddy fuels the revenge that he sought, that the lower class sought, and now Cho Luigi sought. Cho Luigi, not knowing if he's alive or dead yet, walks towards his former boss, only for Kaufman to call him a racial slur and shoot him. Cho Luigi falls to the ground briefly before he reemerges from the shadows, revealing he was now a zombie. In disbelief that Cho Luigi should be dead and is now actually dead, Luigi and Bowser face off. With Cho Luigi pinning Kaufman down, trying to bite the man that wronged him, as Big Daddy comes out of nowhere to roll a lit canister down the ramp. Knowing fuel was flammable from his previous life and from the sacrifice of his charred comrade in the battles before, he causes the lavish limousine to explode, taking out both leader and lapdog in one fell swoop, cascading thousands of dollars into the air for it to all burn. The currency that Kaufman had betrayed so many over was now meaningless, just dust in the wind. Cholo had accomplished his goal in death, and Kaufman got his just desserts. Big Daddy, after witnessing the end of both of these men, can only stand and watch as the empire of man that once shone in the distance was now nothing more than flames and cinders, to either remain as a pile of dust or to be rebuilt by the remainders of man. The Dead Reckoning prepares to leave as they see survivors marching 
marching away from the city. The disenfranchised poor folk were not all dead, and some had escaped and were looking to find new lives out in the wasteland or by rebuilding the city. Through fate, causality, or via the unknown commands of Big Daddy to the undead, did the lives of the lower class be largely spared. The weak, downtrodden, and poor now had full reign over the city and its surrounding area. They could make it their own. As the movie comes to a close, the Dead Reckoning prepares to take off only to catch in its sights the horde of zombies that caused all of this trouble, carnage, inhuman slaughter. Some of its crew prepares to open fire as Riley stops them, peering through his binoculars just as he did when watching them at the start of the movie, both he and Big Daddy's eyes meet again. Big Daddy, aware of the groups and poor folks' presence, merely shrugs them off, looking away as if he was exhausted and tired after a long battle. Big Daddy nods in salute to the underprivileged survivors, not wanting to sacrifice any more of his own or send his dead family after them to fight or eat, simply all of them looking to move on. The deed was done, the war was over. A mutual understanding and respect for one another's existence, living and dead, meant this truce would persist for now. As Riley puts it, Oh, you're just looking for a place to go. Same as us. The war was over, the dead had evolved. The living knew how the world was and how it would be. It would all just be a land of the dead. Now, the movie isn't without its flaws, mind you. It isn't a crash course in cinema forte and symbology like Romero's original trilogy. In fact, it marked more of the on-the-nose approach that was slowly progressing from each movie onwards that Romero would slam into your face with Diary and Survival of the Dead. But the on-the-nose nature of the class struggle and eat-the-rich mentality mixed with Dennis Hopper's character being a bit too much of a generic fat cat is balanced with ground characters attempting to survive, bridged with John Leguizamo's middle ground of wanting to be a rich asshole living the luxury life at any cost, is a nice chemistry that serves its purpose well enough. If there is one thing that irritates me though about this film, and most horror films in general, it is the copious amounts of forced jump scares signified with loud abrupt music and out of place actions. Chago, play some of those. Auditory warning, it's gonna get loud. Cheap jump scares are riddled throughout this movie with questionable choices being made by NPCs and random zombies. It's not like these didn't happen in previous movies, but it feels like Romero had to fill a quota or the studio had to fill a quota of having jump scares to make people scared, which I feel like, again, they're missing the original intent of the Living Dead franchise. But also, don't get me started on the choices made by some of these people. Take his fucking face off. What the hell is even that? I mean, look at this guard lassoing down right in the middle of a horde to just let himself be eaten alive or people just falling down left and right in the mall to be eaten easily. Which would make a good zombie sins? Let me know in the comments if you want a land of the dead zombie sins in the future. The cast of characters may feel generic at times, but they all have unique traits and genuinely cool or near golden character moments. The slow-witted and burned-faced Charlie licking his finger to wet the iron sight of his rifle to catch the glint of the metal to pop a gangster midget pimp. Yes. I did just say that. That's how cool this movie is. Cholo saying he wants to see what the other side is like, showing that there is some perspective that maybe there's something else after death. Kaufman makes cartoonishly evil remarks and actions to make his visage more comedic. Slack shooting Charlie's ear accidentally, trying to imitate his badassness and prove she can be a badass like him, only to fail miserably and comedically at the cost of harming others. Kaufman 
Asian's servant ditching his ass the second trouble finds its way to them? The big Asian dude tossing out a dead zombie from Dead Reckoning at the very end of the movie to scare the audience and saying, now we can go. These characters all serve their purposes for each element that makes the movie unique, but more so it being more about the message of the film, the zombies, the carnage, and everything that drives home these elements. Riley's group just wants to be free of greed, senseless violence, and corruption. Cholo just wanted the high life and was ripped from that after years and years of hard work. Kaufman's power-hungry greed being his undoing. Big Daddy as a zombie leading his fellow zombies. Big Daddy in particular is the highlight of this movie. His portrayal, his demeanor, his actions, his reactions, the way he is able able to convey so much just through his expressions and some loud grunts and stares, giving him the same iconic status, in my opinion, to that of Day of the Dead's Bud. The zombies are probably the strongest characters in all of Romero's works, and probably the best ensemble of dead characters I have ever seen in cinema. All never speaking a word, but their visage and actions letting the music do the talking. Their brutal bloodshed paints Romero's grand vision to those that loved it, and a message that Romero always intertwined within each world of the dead to reflect on the troubles of our own modern world showing that there is always the surface of the gore and guts of the zombie genre there, that there is dark fun to be had in the skin of its flesh, as well as the characters that we can interact with, but also the inner workings of the undead mind that are always there to dig into and flesh out. There is layers, surfaces, to what the Dead series has to offer, and Land of the Dead has that in spades. For me, Land of the Dead will always be the pinnacle gateway movie to all of zombie fiction for me, and it holds a very special place in my heart. It was the first zombie movie that I can remember that I was completely obsessed with. It also holds its memory of my Uncle Kevin, who idolized Romero and his works, and imbued in me what my career would do going forward. While it wasn't his last dead movie, I feel that Land of the Dead was a swan song of zombie movies in general, as it felt like a final chapter in the most critical and influential legacy of zombie history. That ends this critical look into the movie that fully pushed me into falling in love with the zombie genre, encapsulating everything I entertained from it. I hope you enjoyed this look into it. I sat on covering this movie for years because of how much it meant to me and finally decided to give it a whirl. Originally, I was just going to do a zombie sins on it, but decided against it to really show my love for it. Now, if you do want that zombie sins, again, let me know down below. Big shout out to my editor Chago, aka a quick flicks for editing this monster of a video together as we both go on vacation. Check out his channel for awesome movie recaps and special thanks to my Patreon patrons and YouTube channel members for throwing in a buck to support me and getting featured on this list right yonder. Is there other zombie films you feel like broke the mold or deserve to be dissected for its meanings and purposes or just for the pure fun they had? What about Land of the Dead did you love and or hate? Let me know down in the comments. Until next time, I'm Zach Cass, aka Wow Such Gaming. Stay happy, stay healthy, treat others kindly, or they'll jump in rivers coming after you, and most importantly, stay wow.